So yeah, so conversation in chat window about comparing strings. Um, so you can do quote y dot equals buffer. That works perfectly fine too. Strings are funny that way um, because you can. Um, oh yay, my camera's frozen already. Try this again. Hey, camera action. So we can we can do, you know, if buffer dot equals quote y. Right, and that's that's uh, you know, buffer is a string, it's got an equals method, we can give it an argument of y, but you can just as well do the following, quote y dot equals buffer, because this is a string, it has an equals method, we can compare it to buffer like that. So, so, you know, either of those works. And let me see what I actually said in the assignment. Um, da, 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 da. I don't know if I actually specified how you should accept a yes or a no, but um, but if you want to be really kind to the user. Right, you could accept, you know, anything that starts with a Y or a Y as a yes, and anything that starts with an N or an N as a no, and anything else as a, you know, I didn't understand your response. And then if somebody just hits Y or hits yes or something like that, um, then then it will it will continue accordingly. Um, you cannot use equal equal sign for strings, right? So if buffer equals y this won't work just like in C it doesn't work right because this is a string that's a string but they're not the same string this is a string you declared somewhere this is a string the JVM will set up when it compiles your program um, those are different strings this will always fail even if buffer happens to be a string containing the character y, right? That won't show up as being equal with equal equal. So that's just just that that usual business with strings. And it's not just strings, it's any object, but mostly this comes up for us with strings. So how's PA3 coming? Intend to start tomorrow. Okay, confidence. test
All right, so so kind of sounds like um, people are making progress. And there may still be some issues with ingest. Um, let's see. All right, let's let's um. Let's take a look at big picture view of, of organizing this stuff. So we've got our tree class. It holds a root node. That's the main the main entity in there. That's the root of the decision tree, which will start off null. Um, I would say put a method in here, right? Doesn't have to re return anything. Maybe it returns a status or something. But let's let's make a method called read database. which takes in a file name. And this can construct a scanner using that file name. And you could make this a boolean and have it return success or failure if you want. Um, but but um, construct a scanner. And then we're going to say, let's call ingest on that scanner and if we design ingest to return a decision tree created by reading from the current point in the scanner that'll return a decision tree we can just set root equal to that and that can be our whole read database method now you got to do try catch blocks and all of that stuff but but um as pseudocode right um you can do something like this. Now, if you do root equals root dot ingest sc, that should still work if you make ingest a part of the node class. Um, as long as you construct root first so that it's not null, yeah, that should work fine also. So if, if we do this in the tree class, right, we've got our, our read database method, which uses ingest, and then we've got our ingest method, which takes a scanner and should return a root of a tree. And so this is, this is where we, you know, node temp equals uh, new node. Temp dot data, or you know, temp. I don't know. Read in the next line. So read a line from SC. If it's a question, temp dot Q flag equals true. Else equals false. And then read another line and now one of two things happens so um, if it's an answer temp.yes equals temp.no equals null and just return temp. 
right? So your ingest method, right? Um, make an empty node, read two lines from your file. The first one is your, your question flag, right? It's either um, a Q or an A, followed by a colon, so set your question flag accordingly. The next line you read is your actual text of your question or your answer. And then if, if that first line you read said it was an answer, set your children to null and just return. Otherwise, um, otherwise you're reading a question. So now, set your yes child equal to ingest on SC, and then set your no child equal to ingest on SC, and return temp. So there's, there's different way, shapes, and forms you can do this, but, but the heart of the ingest code is really just this. Right, pass it a scanner, read two lines from that, that scanner. First line is a Q colon or an A colon. So use that to decide if you're reading a, a question or an answer. Save the second line in your data field. Set the flag based on the first line. If it's an answer, you're done. Just return your empty, your empty, you know, your node with empty children. If it's a question, call in just twice more and use the return values from those to set the yes and no children of temp, and then return temp. And then in your main program. You can do something like this, right? Um, string. Figure out your file name, which is either 20q.txt or the first argument from the command line. So look at args.length, right, to decide. But set up your file name, and then you can do something like um, tree t equals new tree t dot uh, read database and pass it that file name and now you've got a tree which has a root node which should be equal to the decision tree that was read from that file awesome and then if you want, you can say, you know, t.play. And you can put a play method in here that, you know, goes through your gameplay and so on and so forth. All right, awesome. So yeah, work work on on those as your schedule permits. Um, if people are still working on this Thursday, I may do another open lab on Thursday. Um, but don't um, don't plan to start it Thursday. <laughs> I've had I've had some people in office hours, and it sounds like like people are definitely moving towards um, getting this done. So I don't know if that's a question forming in chat. Thursday is open lab, but but um. But that's kind of like, you know, if you've got some I's that need to be dotted or something like that, it's definitely not the time to start it. Because um, I have office hours, right? You can, you can catch me mornings. Um, my only question is, uh, doesn't Jess know when to skip down the next node below the root? 
or wouldn't it just write over the root node when creating the tree? So, so ingest is one of these recursive things. So it's a little funny to talk about. But we think of, you know, what does ingest do? It starts, you know, at whatever the current position is in the scanner file, and it reads line by line until it's read in a full decision tree, and then it returns that decision tree. That's the thing that ingest does, right? And if we believe that that's what ingest will do, then this code will implement ingest, right? But you kind of have to believe that's what ingest is going to do first. And if that's the correct behavior of ingest, right, start from the current point in the scan file and just keep reading until you've read an entire decision tree and return the root of that tree, if that's true, then this will correctly implement ingest. Right? And so this is, this is mathematical induction, right? If this is correct and this is correct, then this is correct. Right? So that's, you know... P of n, and this is P of n plus 1, something like that. And, and this, you know, I cobbled together by sort of thinking about the node left-right traversal for creating the database file and then reverse engineering it. So you're, you're certainly welcome to, to take this on faith, for now at least, um, and if, if it's not crystal clear why this works, that's okay, right? It, it's, um, it's an algorithm that you're being given, just like, you know, the way that, that we delete a node from a tree um, or the way we balance a tree, right? Um, some parts of that we may just kind of take as this is the algorithm that we use. Um, and so you, could, you can take this like that for the time being. It is kind of baffling and, and that's that's part of the fun of doing recursion actually. Doesn't it feel like 215 was a long time ago? <laughs> it's crazy. And and yeah. Time is getting really freaky these days. I don't know what it is. Um I mean I know time goes fast and it keeps going faster. But um, we're going to be online until probably winter, which means it's going to have been almost two years that I've been teaching online by the time I get back to the classroom, which is really bizarre. And it is already week five. So, yes, this is the halfway point of the course, um, which is good. Yeah, new normal will go back to, to some kind of better new normal. Hopefully not exactly the same normal we had before, but hopefully we'll converge to um, a better normal where, you know, maybe we appreciate being able to have interactions with other people more and maybe we, we look at people with more empathy and compassion and, and still get to go out and eat in restaurants sometimes. Yeah. All right. Let's um let's play around some more with swing. And I'm going to continue using Eclipse today and I think tomorrow maybe we'll um we'll change gears and look at how to do this from like a command line and see what some of these things are that Swing is doing for us. But, um, well, let's just play with Eclipse. All right, so let's um, let's start a new project. So I'm going to close this 
I'm going to do file new Java project. Um, I'm just going to call this widgets and uncheck that if it checks for you and say finish. How many people here, show of hands or, or me too in chat, how many people have got Eclipse up and running in some kind of environment where they can, they can do some of this stuff? Looks like about half and half. Or already had Eclipse. Okay. Cool. Um, I might go through PA4 on Wednesday. If not Wednesday, definitely Friday. Um, but we're heading to it quickly. Okay, yeah, about half and half have it working. Um, so I'm going to do file new and other and window builder and swing designer, and I'm going to create a JFrame. That's our kind of standard main uh, class for making GUIs. So uh, what should we call this? Um, I'll just call it W test for widget test, and I'll finish. And so there's our, our boilerplate code. And I'll go ahead and run this. And there's our window popping up. And I can close it like this. All right. So um, keystrokes. So window preferences. I'm going to do shortcuts and go down to keys. And you can adjust or create shortcuts for different things. So I don't like having to, to point and click to do things. So um, I've made a shortcut for running. So if you come down here to run, um, I created a shortcut control R. So if I'm in, in uh, my window, any of my windows and I hit control R, that's going to run my my program so I don't have to come up here and click I can just hit control R and it starts running and the default I think is control F11 if that works for you that's that's fine too but um, you know the more you point and click the more distracted you're going to be so so I kinda recommend setting up some shortcuts to make life easy for yourself um, from the command line, right, you just type in Java program name, enter, you just type go if you set up an alias or something. So, um, but anyway, um, so let's see. Let's, let's um, take a closer look at some of these, these things that we can put onto our, um, our GUI. So let's start with the simplest of all, which is a label. And, and um, if I take an object and I try to drop it in here, I get this sort of north, south, west, east, center view. Um, this is this is kind of the default layout manager, which means you know I can I can place a label here, and I can place a button over here, and I could place a text field up here on the top. And if I run that, right, I get a window that looks like this. And I got a big button in the middle and a label over here and a text field up here on the top, right? But if I resize, things move around accordingly, right? So, so things grow in a way that's supposed to be, you know, fairly reasonable. Um, giant button. So let me let me undo those. So I'm just Control Zing to undo. So I'm back to my original setup. Um, I'm going to do an absolute layout. So I'm going to click the absolute layout button. Come in here. Make sure I've got a green rectangle. Just left click, and that gives me this this um, this layout manager where I can drop something and it'll stay exactly where I put it. 
when we were back in uh, APH, before the STEM building opened, there was a lab right across from, from where the main class was. It was a lab where Carol and Tina taught mechanical stuff. And there was a machine in there, and the machine had a giant red button at the bottom with a handwritten sign next to it that says, Do not press the red button. <laughs> And of course, everybody did, and I think it was probably like running a tally or something to record how many people press it. <laughs> but it's like a wet paint sign. All right, so over here, right, we're looking at the properties of, of this, and it says, you know, the layout is absolute. And we could click on this and choose some different kind of layout and so on and so forth. But we're just going to go with an absolute layout right now. Um... So about the simplest component is a J label. So let me click on one of these and place this somewhere in here. And it's going to crash my system, which is always exciting. Psychology is a hard word to spell. All right, so I didn't I didn't do what I said you should do, which is hit Control S frequently. Um, so I'm going to save this. Okay, we're going to do an absolute layout, and I'm going to take a J label, and I'm going to drop it in here. And so so that's that's simplicity in itself. If I run this, I've just got a box, and it's got you know a label in the middle. All right, so what can we do with this? Well, let's look at the code first. So um, this is the code that got created when I made that label. So basically, it constructs a J label, and you can construct with an argument which says, what should I display in that label? So it's an object of type J label. It's called label new label. Um, this sets the location and the dimensions for it, and then it adds it to the content pane, which is this thing called a J panel which is sitting inside of our J frame. So J frame is the outer box which includes, you know, these buttons at the very top for maximizing, minimizing and so on. The J panel is the area inside that window that we actually drop components onto. Um, yeah, the save button should be a big red button. <laughs> and so we've we've added this to um, to the content pane. Now, if, if you want to change the names of things, right, I could come in here and I could just, you know, change that to, to be something else. Um, and that's fine, except then you have to make sure you change it everywhere that it's used. Um, so, so since we're in Window Builder anyway, if I want to change the name of this variable, I can just do it in this window here. So I don't know, what should we call this? Um, yeah, so we're refactoring basically. Um, so let me just call this text out. And now if I come back to to here, my J label is called text out, text out dot set bounds, content pane add text out. All right, and you know you can change this code. Um, right, I can change the label to say ready, and when I look at my window over here, it says ready. All right, so um, there's this connection between um, what we can do in Window Builder and what we can do in code and how this actually looks you know visually when we run it um, and they're all they're all related to each other so if I come in here for example I can I can um, let's go to all properties let me make this a little bigger and if I go down to foreground so my foreground 
right now is mostly dark I could change this to an annoying red for example and my label becomes red and if I run it right I've got a window with a red label and what did that do it created a line of text which said text out which is the name of the J label set foreground and the argument it used for that was uppercase color dot uppercase red yeah unfortunate user interface designs there's there's whole topics on that online but that sounds like a bad I still get tripped up by those even though I know that that sometimes you have to read them carefully um, and I it yeah I won't rant um, so let's let's look at some documentation so uh, J label has various methods available to it um, set foreground um, is not you know an option in here but it's part of the component class and set foreground takes an argument of type color and color is another class right it's an extension of an object um, and it has a number of static fields defined including a static field called red which corresponds to the color red since it's a static field we can access this this value by saying the name of the class which is color with an uppercase c dot the name of the field red we could also have said red lowercase it has fields of you know both names and so we could um, you know color dot green and that'll make our label green and really really difficult to, to read color also has other ways we can construct for example we can pass a set of three integers red green and blue each in the value 0 to 255 and we can make a mix of colors So, for example, if I want a blue label, I could say let's make a new color, 0 red, 0 green, 255 blue. Yeah, it's just like CSS, right? Now I got a label that's blue. And if I wanted to do a mix of green and blue, but I saved it. So if I wanted to do a mix of green and blue, right I get my my turquoise it doesn't like green and blue <laughs> it's like no I'm not gonna do that we can also specify a color we can construct a color with floating point numbers from 0 to 1 with red green and blue and if we have a color we can say how much blue is in that color we can say get blue and it'll give us an integer from 0 to 255. Right? So so everything is an object, right? Including colors. And and so lots of different ways that we can we can specify a color. Um, usually it's just color dot in the name of the color. But, you know, you can dial us in in a more uh, careful way. So, so let's talk a moment about colors. Um, depending on how much you've done with painting or or with graphics, um, I 
I really like this pen because it's like heavy and it's got a dragon on it with like little stones for its eyes but it does not work very well after you've used it for a little bit that's too bad alright so um three primary colors when you're mixing light red green and blue if you're mixing uh, pigments I think it's red yellow and blue I'm not sure but for paints there's three different primaries but for light red green and blue combinations of those give you all the colors that you want um, so red and green should give you yellow yeah red little yellow blue okay good um, so primary for paints or pigments for light it's red green blue um, so red and green should give you yellow right right so when when you mix pigments you get dark and when you mix light you get light um, so if if you do full intensity on all three guns you get white and if you do zeros which is all of those those beams off you get black Yeah, and I grew, I grew up with light colors, and, and pigments are new to me. Yellow is the Jedi version of brown. I like it. All right. So, um, so the way this, this works, um, typically 0 to 255. And you can just specify a mix of how much of each of these do you want. And, and when you see like a color wheel setting um, I can't get a color wheel up here but um, if if you hover over these you'll see different different representations of these so up here on the top there's there's a hex number coming out right seven a eight a nine nine right so those those are hexadecimal intensities of red green and blue and so in hex this is zero to ff and so we can represent a color rgb as six hex digits and so those codes that you use, you know, in, in HTML and such are usually just a hexadecimal representation of the intensities of these three colors. And we don't need to worry about that, right? Mostly we're just going to grab a color from, from a palette in here, or we're just going to say color.green, color.blue, or whatever. But, you know, you can, you can dial it in precisely. Um, and this is this is standard. This isn't just Java or Swing. This is this is pretty standard. Um, this is how your monitors work. Right? If you look at an old VGA cable, there are three pins which correspond to red, green, and blue. There's actually multiple ones, but there's a set of pins for red, green, and blue, and the voltage level on those corresponds to how much intensity the beam should be displaying red, green, and blue as it sweeps across your display. There should be a color to upload. Uh, you could have four pins. Depends on the interface. Um, and OLED is more about, I think, the technology for the LEDs themselves. But like a plain old VGA connector um, is like 15 pins. And some of those are red, some are green, some are blue, some are sync signals. 
we're going to to be doing graphics and drawing things by hand so this is this is definitely topical um but a little bit ahead of of where we are right now but um we'll talk about this idea of you know having a display and doing these raster scans to create an image and so as you're scanning you can basically adjust you know how much red green or blue you want at each point along this pattern of scan lines and by turning those on or off in the right spot you get you know an image and if you do it at least 30 times a second it looks like a stationary image because our brains you know put the images together and yeah in, in most displays you have a little red LED a green LED and a blue LED right next to each other and then a red and a green and a blue right next to each other and so on so it's a whole bunch of individual red green blue dots but your eyes blend them together so if there's a red and a green you see yellow And it's pretty crazy that all this stuff works, but it does. All right, so J labels. Um, we can control, you know, the the foreground text. We can control the background, um, but not not exactly like you might think. So let's make a really offensive background there. So um, that doesn't change, you know, the back of this to be gray, for example, or you know, to be. Um, turquoise um, but we can add a border to this so let's um, let's go back to all properties and click on border and we can select for example a beveled border and so there we've got you know a little bit of a, a bright turquoise and a dark dark turquoise And so, so you can, you know, spend a lifetime just customizing a, a label, right? Um, borders, foreground, background, you can control the font. Um, where's my font? Font, so we're using uh, Dialog 12. We could use Font Awesome. That doesn't look very awesome. We could make this bold italic. Oh, but that doesn't seem to do anything. I actually have these fonts. Hmm, interesting. Uh, I think I have to do something else. I think I have something set up so it's using like my system defaults. Um, but anyway, theoretically, you can change the font on um, on these. Um, what is going on in chat over here? Yeah, we'll talk about CRTs when we talk about, about painting uh, windows. Um, is it a, is the image on the screen with electron gun? Yeah, totally. Um, and even better than CRTs or vector displays. We'll talk about those too. Um, and yeah, that is that is kind of an issue with ESLPs. Unfortunately, you start the SLPs before you get into all of the the 200 level CS stuff, and sometimes the engineering stuff. Um, yeah, I think the rectangles mean I don't have the font, or it's not displaying correctly. Yeah, vector displays like arcade machines. Like there was an old Star Wars game that that looked fundamentally different from, you know, Space Invaders and all the other games of that era. 
and it's because it was actually drawing um, the vectors. It was moving the electron beam from point to point instead of doing a raster scan. Yeah, it's super high until you get to too many vectors, and then it starts to get wonky. All right, so 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 that's that's setting up these things from here, right? But we can also we can set up these things from code, right? So um, so I can change the label. So l let me cheat and put a button on here. And I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but I want a way to engage in action. So let's go in here and let's have our button do something. I want my button to change my label. Okay, so my label is called text out. And so I'll set uh, the text of my, my label to be ha ha ha. And it doesn't change anything over here, but if I run this, And there's, there's my window. If I click on the new button, right, it changes my label to ha ha ha. Um, you don't need to learn the color codes for this, but they're really useful to know in general. Um, and it's just red, green, blue, 0 to 255 each. Um, you'll encounter that so many times in life that, you know, eventually you'll just remember it whether you try or not. Um, but we don't need to. So let's let's count how many times we click a button, right? So so how can we do this? We come in here when we when we do a click, we'll come down to this line of code. Let's just um, Let's just print out number of clicks equals, and we'll just print out some counter. And and we'll we'll bump up that counter each time that we get a click. And it's going to complain that count isn't isn't uh, can't be resolved to a variable. So let's just make that a variable. And I don't want to put that variable inside here, I want it to be a class variable, so I'm going to go way up here in the beginning, and I'm going to say um, integer count equals zero. And this will be the number of clicks on the button. And if I come back here, um, let's go ahead and run this. So it's telling me, ready, I'm going to click this button. It says number of clicks is 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Oh, the code for writing new buttons and stuff. Um, I don't think you have to worry about it at this point. Um, I think it's fine to, to just be using Window Builder and let it write the code for us. Um, We'll take a look at how to do this without using Window Builder, just to kind of get an idea, you know, sort of demystify it. But yeah, certainly for, for the next few weeks, I would just go ahead and use Window Builder. And then later on, if you want to dig into doing this by hand, um, you can get into the code. So yeah, we got a clicker game, right? See how fast you can get to 50. And you can have races. Awesome. Yay, cookie clicker beta. All right. Um, so, so um, let's dig more into buttons tomorrow um, and, and take a look at some of the, the actions we can respond to with those. And I want to look at key codes and things like that. Um, and then check boxes and radio buttons. And then we'll talk about inner classes and we'll get into all kinds of stuff. So we're going to keep expanding swing and, and breaking it down over the next few days. Um, and then um, towards the end of the week, we'll get into PA4. All right, cool. Have a good um, afternoon. I will see you next time.